Sosa? And, of course, 
visits all the great museums that are in New York. She wonders what she will specialize in. There's much talk uh, amongst the students about what they're going to specialize in. And Mr. Henry tells her, why don't you take the story of your people? And she thinks that this is good advice, and this is what she does. Uh, during this uh, five or six years, Minerva has several boyfriends. Uh, she goes out with a young man who is not a member of the church. He's a deputy sheriff in Pocatello. She writes in her journal, I suppose that someday I will marry him, but she tells him that she will not marry until she receives her education. Uh, one day they're talking and, and talking about getting married, and he says, I won't be married by the Black and Black Mormon Bishop at a Black and Black Mormon Church. And Minerva sends him back. Uh, she has another young man that uh, she really likes by the name of Herman Tiger. Herman also is not a member, he's a cowboy. And, uh, and so they get quite serious and begin to talk of marriage. But they both have just recently filed on homestead claims in the bottom land along the Snake River. And they feel that they can't marry until they prove up on these, which they expect to take about three years to do before they can receive clear title. Uh, during the last year, this is during the First World War that's raging in Europe, Herman volunteers for the draft, but they don't call him up right away. So a number of months go by, and one Saturday evening at about 6.30, he shows up at the nervous doorstep and says, I need to leave Monday morning for Seattle for one basic training. He says, let's get married, and she says, okay. And he tells her to go to the courthouse. In those days, the courthouse was open all day Saturday until 9 p.m. And he tells her, you put on a dress, go get us a marriage license, I'll go home and put on a suit, and we'll get married. And so at a quarter to nine, they were married by her state president in the courthouse. Monday morning, they get on the train and go to Seattle. Uh, they're in basic training, or Herman was in basic training. Oh, I should tell you at this time, Minerva's 29 years old. Uh, Herman's in basic training for four months, and the day that she's pregnant, five year olds are out, and he is told to get on his train, he's being sent to Europe. And so she waves goodbye to him, she writes in her journal, I went home and cried all day and all night, and then the next morning I got up, sold what few meager possessions we had, a lot of train tickets for Pocatello to live with my married sister. She is carrying their first child. After about six months, their first son was born. She names him Herman after her husband. Uh, her sister gives birth to a son at about the same time. Five or six months later, the family is stricken with the deadly Spanish influenza. Uh, her sister gets it, her sister's son Minerva, and her son Herman all come down. Her sister's son actually dies from Spanish influenza. And Minerva feels that she's very close to dying herself. And so with about her last bit of strength, she gets on her knees and she prays to the Lord. And she asks the Lord to spare herself and her son and her sister. And she covenants with the Lord, if he will do that, that she will use her talent to further her care upon the earth. Her prayer is answered. The three of them are able to recover. It's about three months later, or about three weeks later, she begged me to get up out of bed. Now, it was a custom in those days that when uh, people come, uh, back to this, uh, were stricken with the Spanish influenza, that they kept them in a darkened room because they thought that the light would harm their eyes. And Nerva writes in her journal that she actually had a scarf a good share of the time bound around her head. Well, when she finally able to get out of her sick bed, she looks at herself in the mirror and discovers that her hair has turned snow white. She interprets this as a sign from the Lord of her covenant. And she says afterwards that she never looks in a mirror with what she is reminded of the covenant that she has made with the Lord. She at this time is 31 years old. Herman eventually comes home from Europe. Uh, they move out onto their homesteads uh, on the Snake River bottoms and three more children are born over the next six or seven years. 
three more boys, Alice and a daughter, Lori. The um, uh, American Falls Dam is completed after they've been out there for six or seven years. The water begins to back up, and they realize that it's sooner. They're told that it will soon cover their farm, and, uh, and so they leave their farm. Whatever writes in regard to that she was the last white woman to leave the city of the lives. They buy a cattle ranch in Cokeville, Wyoming, and several years after, their last child, a son, is born who uh, named John. And I'll tell you a little more about John later. In 1933, Herman joins the church. He's baptized. And as soon as they're able, they travel to the temple in Logan. And there the uh, Herman receive, they all receive their endowments and their children are and their seal on their children are sealed to them. Minerva counts this as the greatest blessing in her life. Uh, incidentally, I should tell you that a year or so later, Herman is called to be a counselor in the War Bishopric. He serves at 20 years in that position. Uh, and he was well known. Minerva's favorite color is red, and you'll often see lots of red in her paintings. She says, oh, she says, I hope the Lord has red in heaven. She just <laughs> loved the color red. And this is where my hair was red. <laughs> and I was the only one in the air. It really was red, and I can prove it. <laughs> the picture of me on my first <laughs> But I did. Beautiful world. My grandparents, as I mentioned, just lived several years now. Uh, Grandma became very good friends with Minerva. She folded a lot for Minerva. And uh, if we could have slide number one. This is my grandmother. The painting is called Song of Common Sita. And this painting is owned by my Aunt Betty, and in her home today. Uh, as I spent a lot of time, particularly in the summertime, the call would often come, Send it fine down the clothes for me. Tell me I've got milk and cookies. And in those days, I didn't let anything for milk and cookies. I still will. <laughs> uh, so slide number two, please. I'm a little red headed boy. My hair is not very red in there. Uh, Whatever painted many variations of this theme of the hand card people, and I can be found in most all of them. She also painted many scenes of the pioneers in their covered wagons. And again, I'm a little more than ever more. <laughs> so I didn't hear a little bit. Uh, I like to go down there not only for the milk and the cookies, but because Minerva told such wonderful stories. She told about the cowboys and the Indians that lived short of the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. And she painted a lot of Indian paintings and life on the farm. She had a border that ran all the way around the top of her wall in her living room. And this border was about two feet high. And she had painted that. It was on canvas. And she glued it up there. It depicted scenes from the ranch on the snake river bottom. And I never tired to forget that. Uh, my Aunt Betty, who also closed on, uh, on numerous times for the river, tells this story. One day she comes down, and I was about four or five at the time, and I don't remember this happening, where she did. She comes down to Grandma's place, and she's carrying a large painting, and she gives it to Grandma, and the figure painting is Montezuma, and the picture is titled Montezuma's Revenge, and it was a fierce thing that he tells me. Actually, she says I was scared of it, <laughs> because of the spears and the knives and whatnot. Montezuma, as you might recall, was the first war chief of the Aztec nation. And so, about three or four months later, she comes back down, looks around and can't see the painting anymore. And so she says, maybe, what did you do with my painting I get to? Uh, my grandmother's name is Mary, but everybody called her maybe, I don't know why. 
My grandma looks a little flustered and gets a little red in the face, and finally she stammers out, Well, Minerva, I didn't have any place to hang it down here. So I hung it in the stairwell. There were three bedrooms and stairs. And Minerva jumps up, walks over to the door in the corner of the parlor, comes up the stairs, takes the painting off the wall, comes back down with it tucked under her arm. And as she goes out the door, she says, Maybe nobody hangs one of my paintings in their stairwell. <laughs> and we never saw it again. Actually, she painted over the top of it, and uh, something else over the top of it. And the painting no longer exists. As I said, my Aunt Betty uh, uh, posed for her numerous times. Uh, Aunt Betty was 18 years old, graduating from Coteville High, and she was posing. And Minerva said, Betty, what are you going to do with your life? And my Aunt Betty used to like to embroidered dish towels and Minerva tells her there's a lot more to life than embroidered dish towels, <laughs> which she said that she discovered. And she tells Minerva that, oh, I'd so love to go to the BYU, love to go to college, but there's just no money. This is the height of the depression. And she said there's just no money. And Minerva said, well, then, we'll just paint your way through school. We have an excellent This is wonderful. And so she paints this painting, which Ed Petty poses for. On the side is her son Robert, and in the back is her daughter Lori. This is one of her better known paintings. She donates it to BYU in return for Ed Petty's tuition and fees to go to BYU. Uh, while there, Ed Petty meets a young man by the name of William Lee Stokes, who is a graduate student teaching geology, and she took a class from them. They dated, fell in love, and made plans to marry. In the meantime, should we have number five, please? Minerva paints Betty again in her famous Queen Esther painting. Now, she made two copies, several copies of this. Uh, this is the original with the two handmaidens in the background. Uh, the painting that the Brigham University owns has three handmaidens, and that's how you can tell them apart. My Aunt Betty holds the original Queen Esther painting that hangs in the home today. I would like to introduce to you Queen Esther. <laughs>
She did less many lives. In 1947, Minerva was approached by the church to paint the world room in the Manti Temple. And she goes down and looks at it, and it's a large room, approximately 30 feet wide, 60 feet long, with 21 foot high walls. And she goes home and, and uh, counsels with her husband, Herman, wanting to know what to do. And Herman tells her, well, we're really probably can you. If you do it, but if you don't do it, it most certainly will kill you. <laughs> so she accepts the commission, takes some preliminary drawings to the brethren, and those of you who have been to the Manhattan Temple know that the world room is a radical departure from what's found in other temples. Yes. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide yet. I just had this black and white photo, and you probably can't tell them about it. But in the, in the painting are uh, a castle, a mosque, people, a ship. It's quite, like I say, it's quite a radical departure from what you would kind of normally would expect. She hires a young man to help her paint from Coatville who has artistic talent. She's told that it will take over a year, and so she should perhaps either buy a house or find some place where she can spend over a year at. They go down, they start to paint. And Minerva tells mother that often she, they paint 12 to 14 hours, six days a week. And Minerva tells mother that she, afterwards, that she was often so exhausted that she would have to lay down and rest before she could climb down off the scaffolding. Mm -hmm. She also tells that the spirit was very strong. Occasionally they would come to an impasse where they didn't quite know how to proceed. They would kneel on the planks of the scaffolding and pray, and the way would be open get up and continue painting. She finishes the painting in 23 working days. She calls the brother and says, tells them that she's finished. And they're incredulous. They say, you couldn't possibly be finished. And she says, well, come down and look. And so they do. They go down and look and they agree with her that the painting is finished and they accept it. Mm -hmm. Whatever was a fast painter, she didn't dilly dally around or waste any time. She really didn't have all that much time to paint when the family was small. Somebody asked her once, when do you find time to paint? And she says, oh, sometimes I find a few minutes in the evening when the children are in bed. Minerva pitched hay right alongside her sons on the farm. They had quite a dairy operation, which was Minerva's responsibility to take care of. She sold milk and butter and cream and eggs from the chickens to continue that. She was a hard worker. Someone once asked her, how do you know when to quit? And she says, well, that's easy. I quit painting when the story was told. And that's what she did when the story was told. She quit painting. In middle life, she decides to illustrate the Book of Marvel. And over the course of the next two or three years, she uh, paints 45 large paint of the signs you see here. And when she's done, she takes them out of Salt Lake and presents them uh, to the brother. And they uh, were rather lukewarm in there as they saw them. You, you remember this is the same time that Lord Friedman painted his paintings in the Book of Mormon. And the church actually accepted his over the uh, She was very disappointed and they said she was heartbroken. Uh, she calls mother from Salt Lake and says, told, tells her the sad news. And she says, Marie, what will I do with them? She says, I don't have room to even store them. And mother tells her, well, my sister Charlotte lives in Salt Lake. And I'll call her. She has a large home. And perhaps she can help you out there. And so she calls Aunt Charlotte. Matter of fact, Aunt Charlotte and Uncle Ruben just live on Michigan up here about five blocks east of, of this building. Uh, Aunt Charlotte tells Mother Sender that I, I can take her home for her. And so she takes him down to Aunt Charlotte. Aunt Charlotte had a family room in the basement, uh, which was no longer used and it becomes sort of a catch-all. Her family is all married and out of the home. And so they pa pack a bag of 45 large pages. They are canvas stretched on the window floor, so just lean up against the wall. And there they remain for a number of years, two years. 
tutorable. Uh, I love the outlook and I spent a lot of time with my Aunt Charlotte too. And Charlotte and Mother were very close. And I would always go down every chance I got and go through those paintings. I know enough not to touch the painted surface, but I'm sure with this name you can find my fingerprints all over the edges. <laughs> I had several of the favorites, which we had number seven points. This is called the Turn of the Captives, and this is inspired by First Nephi, the 22nd chapter of the 12th verse. This is when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, overruns Israel and takes a number of the Jewish women back to his kingdom and later releases them to return to their home. Uh, my mother calls <coughs> for the central figure on this page. That's why it's one of my favorites. In 2008, when they had a major exposition of uh, the nervous painting at the BYU Museum of Fine Arts, this was prominent at this point. And you may remember that they had a large silk banner outside the door, which hung horizontally. And so the center section of that was cut out and Mother hung out in front of there. The program also featured Mother mm -hmm. on, on the front of the uh, The second painting that I really loved was Lee High Street of the Iron Rod. And we have another eight points. Inspiration for this, of course, is taken from the chapter of First Year. Uh, I could stare at that painting for just hours. I just love that painting. After about two years, Aunt Charlotte calls mother and says, Marie, tell me when to come and get her painting. I just can't be responsible for it any longer. Why, what if the pipe should break for my house burn down? Or they should become, uh, become damaged in some other way. I need her to come and get them. And so mother calls from the room. She goes down and gets the step. But she, before she takes them out, she tells Aunt Charlotte, Pick one for yourself for storing for the two years. And much to my great delight, she picks the high string of the iron rod. Mm -hmm. Now, Aunt Charlotte never hangs it. Uh, I don't know why. It stays in her basement for two or three years. And finally, she offers the painting to her son, Lewis, her oldest son, Lewis. And he says, sure, I'd love to have it. And so he takes it, and he frames it, and he hangs it in his home or at home for a number of years. Later on, as he retires from his practice, they sell uh, their large home and buy a small condo. Now, he doesn't have room for it. And so he called his son David in Sacramento. David's a very uh, prominent attorney, uh, has a big practice in Sacramento, and asks him if he would take it. He says yes, so he comes and gets it. And he hangs it in his home, where it remains for a number of years. Later on, as they're nearing retirement age, uh, my cousin David and his wife Pam, they are called as temple workers to the San Diego temple. And they work there for several years. One night, David wakes up and wakes up his wife. And he says, they're, they're incidentally they're building a new temple at Newport Beach. And it's under construction now, just north of San Diego. And he tells his wife, I've had a premonition that we should donate this painting to the new temple. What do you think of that? And she says, oh, David, I've had that premonition myself for a week or more, but I haven't dared mention it to you because I know how much you love that painting. Arrangements were made for the painting to be transferred up to the temple under construction. It hangs in the uh, lounge, and it is the only painting in the lounge. And the entire room is decorated around that painting. When President Hinckley came down to dedicate uh, the temple, he asked the temple president to take him to the painting. Mm -hmm. And so they did, and he gazed at that for several moments. And finally, he turns to the temple president and said, at last, it's come home. This is where it belongs, and there it hangs today. Many temples and chapels have uh, originals and copies of the nervous painting. I've never I've been in about 40 temples and I've always been able to find either a printer or an original who the tiger's painting. Uh, it's entirely appropriate that we hold this uh, meeting here. There are seven paintings of the nervous that I'm aware of, and maybe more, in this building, at least three 
are originals. The two behind you and the one out in the foyer. They are originals. Uh, there may be more, but I'm not aware of uh, Some of them I know are copies. As I mentioned, she uh, painted a lot of scenes from uh, the ranch life on the Snake River Bottom and also many scenes of Indians. She was very sympathetic to the, uh, to the Indians in her plight. The Stark Museum in Orange, Texas is a major collector of her ranch pictures and her Indian paintings, and they own a bunch. About 10 or 12 years ago, I happened to be in the old desert bookstore, and as always I would go come through the prints that were in back and see if I could find some of the little tigers and they were usually there. I was in there one morning, the store had just opened, it was very busy, there were hardly any customers, and so I was back there coming through the prints. And uh, a sister came over and introduced herself and said, can I help you? Turned out she was director of, of that department. And so I said, yeah, I'm looking for some of the Minerva Tiger came. And she says, oh, they're over here in another place. And so we went over and I was looking at them and uh, she asked why my interest in, of course, I had told her that I had posed for a dozen of paintings as had my mother and my grandmother and others. And she told me a story about Minerva. Back in the 1940s, Minerva painted a painting called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, out of the fourth, fourth chapter of the Book of Revelations. I had never seen the painting. Uh, I've seen it since, the original. It's a magnificent painting. You can about hear the ground thunder from the, from the hooves of the horses. It's just a magnificent painting. When it was finished, she took it to Salt Lake and presented it to a young couple she was acquainted with there that had just opened a small gallery in Salt Lake. And oh, they loved it. She offered it to them for sale for $8,000. And they wanted it really badly. The money was tight. They just opened the business. The cash flow was bad. But finally, they determined to acquire the painting that they got a second mortgage for $8,000 on their own and buy the painting. Hangs in their gallery for many years, as far as I know, it's still there. Uh, I've seen it in several shows, several shows. And then she goes on to tell me that several years ago, they were offered in the neighborhood of $100,000 for the painting. And they turned it down. She made many paintings of the Savior. Can we have number 10, please? She painted the Savior in the white robe, the original of this, uh, hangs in the bottom of the state center, high council room. She also painted the Savior in uh, Mary and Martha's home. She painted the Savior in the red robe. Many paintings of the Savior. Can we have the next slide. Mm -hmm. This is the painting of the Savior in the red robe. This is the original hangs in the entrance to the Salt Lake Temple. As you approach the recommend desk, it's immediately to your left. There's also another uh, painting in the Salt Lake Temple. As you walk down the hallway to the women's dressing room, it's hanging on the wall there. There's a little red-headed boy. It's a pioneer. There's a little red-headed boy. <laughs> uh, Mother, in about 40, 1946 or 47, receives a small inheritance from her father's estate, and she determines that she would spend the money in modernizing the home. We lived in a small log home. There were four rooms in it. We had a kitchen and a dining room and two small bedrooms. No central heating and no plumbing. <coughs> and, uh, well, we had a lot of times with that water. It was an old hand pump. And of course, with our phone below when winters in Wyoming, it often froze up. And my dad's language would get pretty colorful with it. Was trying to kind of uh, I didn't mind the fact that there was a pretty out there, but I hated bathing. Mother would heat a big tub on the stove. Us four children would climb her in. The girls started spending my brother in law and finally me. I always got the last bath. And I hated it. Well, I was so thrilled when we finally had uh, uh, plumbing in the house and simply turn on the tap and what hot, hot water would come out. Uh, mother added a large living room and fireplace at the end, another bedroom, and 
install central heating and plumbing. After it was completed, she approached me and I said, Minerva, I'd like you to paint my portrait and Minerva let me get me. Uh, she says, come out and sit for me and I'll make a staff for the winter sketch. And mother did that. And then about three months later, she called mother and said, come down and get your painting and it's done. And so we went down uh, to get that and it was rolled up. It wasn't framed or anything. She unrolled it and lo and behold, it was a full length painting. Mother was dressed in a paint, red painted shawl draped over her shoulder, which was one of her trademarks. And Mother took one look at it and said, Oh, Minerva, I just wanted a small picture of my top of portrait. She says, I won't be able to even afford to frame this thing. And Minerva walked over to her desk and put her scissors and went snip, 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 snip. <laughs> And this is our mother, Marie Anderson Curtis, painted and cut off. <laughs> this painting belongs to my sister Kathy now. Uh, she's gracious and God brought it down here and she will appreciate that. After mother passed away, uh, mother owned two paintings Incidentally, she did not charge her mother for this, like I said, mother was an extremely close friend. Uh, we were invited by our attorney to take the two paintings uh, and have them evaluated for estate tax purposes. And so we called the church uh, Museum of History and Art and found the name of a gentleman who was the expert in Salt Lake on the Nerva Tigers page. We made an appointment, put the paintings down. The one painting was about this size and it was of flower, uh, mums in large vase. He looked at it quickly and valued it at, uh, if I remember correctly, at $10,000. And then he looked at this one and he looked and he walked around and he scratched his chin. And I became quite alarmed and I said, what's the matter? <laughs> she signed it right in the corner. You can see it's an authentic Nerva Tiger. He said, oh, yes, yes. He said, Anybody can tell that's a Minerva Tiger painting, but it's so unusual. And so I asked him, well, what's so unusual about it? And he said, well, Minerva always painted people full way. <laughs> and I said, well, there's a story there. And I told him the story, and I thought the poor guy was going to have a fit. He said, well, that's terrible. <laughs> he kind of like the parents. And he valued the painting at thirty to $40,000 at that time and said that it would probably be worth close to double that amount if it had been full length. Oh, no. <laughs> we have another option. This is a photograph of Minerva uh, K. Tigert. Minerva is dressed in a blue dress with white polka dots. I never saw her wear another dress except that one to church. And she never missed anything. And she always wore that dress. Uh, she also has the headband. This became another one of her signature features. She started wearing a headband in her uh, early 20s, and she never saw her without a headband around her beautiful white hair. Uh, she uh, has a problem with her eyes in middle, middle uh, age. She begins to lose her eyesight, and so she goes to specialists in Salt Lake, and she is diagnosed with lead painting. Minerva painted a lot with her fingers, and she absorbed the lead out of the painting through the skin of her fingers. They x-rayed, among other things, her head, discovered that the inside cavity where the nerve is, and all of her teeth were lined with lead. And so she has her teeth pulled, and she wears dentures the rest of her life. She's told by the doctor to stop painting, and she tells, uh, tells her family she would. She'd stop for a few days, sometimes a week or two, but then she'd be back there with her fingers in the paint. And her family would get after her, and she tells them, I must paint. I have driven to it. And Minerva always felt that if she didn't paint, that she would lose her talent. She knew where it came from. She, she knew it was a gift from the Lord. Minerva had three great strengths in her life. Uh, 
First of all, it's her family. She took really good care of her family. They always came first. <coughs> of her marriage, it was a good, solid marriage. And she would tell us, I take good care of Herman, and he takes good care of me. And she did have a good, a good marriage. Her second great strength was her testimony. Uh, she had a very positive, strong testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And never a, a testimony meeting went by with what she would stand in. She had uh, almost an encyclopedic knowledge of the scripture, which meant she had searched them so much. Her third great gift, of course, was her ability to paint her feet from the Lord. In 1973, she falls and breaks her hip, and this effectively, uh, she's bedridden after that, required constant care. And this effectively ends her painting career. In 1976, she passes away and is buried in the Cokeville, Wyoming Cemetery. Six years later, her husband joins her there. Her daughter, Lori, after the Lord passed on, tried to catalog her painting and spent some time doing that. And finally gave, gave it up because as her paintings began to rise in value, there were just more and more paintings just come out of the woodwork. And she just couldn't get a handle on it. But she estimates that Minerva painted in excess of 1,000 large paintings, like you see here, and many small ones, like you see over here. And I forgot to tell you about those, which I will do now. The middle one is my sister Anne. And Minerva painted that uh, before she was married and gave it to Anne. And one of the flowers, uh, Anne's husband was killed three years later in an accident. And she painted those flowers for the funeral service. Did I know about that? Mm -hmm. Well, now you One of them left, Minerva and her husband were members of the Wyoming Cattlemen's <coughs> Association. They took a month trip with the Cattlemen's Association to South America, where they toured large cattle ranches in Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. And this, in one of the holes, the hotels they stayed at, was their maid. And she painted that, that sympathetic <coughs> Minerva Tiger painting. We never discovered that painting until after Minerva passed away. And the girls cleaned out her closets and found that stacked in a box in the closets. It is a pathetic Minerva Tiger. Uh, Minerva was really a larger than life person. Her husband, as I've said, was a counseling bishop for 20 years. Her oldest son, Herman, and her youngest son, John, were both bishops of the Cokeville Ward. As you know, my wife's from Finland. Uh, after we were married, we came to, back to Cokeville and lived there for a number of years. And when the first time Marty met John, she immediately recognized him as one of the missionaries who had taught the gospel to her family in Finland. Like I say, Minerva blessed many lives. <clears throat> Much of the uh, memorabilia from her career, for example, her sketches, her preliminary sketches, letters to family and friends, and her journals are housed in, uh, at the BYU, in BYU, in the L. Tom Perry Special Collection. Minerva wasn't very tall, she was five foot two, but she had a commanding presence. She always knew when Minerva was in the room. Uh, she often dominated the conversation, but in a quiet, soft spoken way. She was, by the same token, quite a feisty lady. She was more interested in people and ideas, not things. In her letter to her daughter Mary, who lives in San Bernardino, she writes, and I quote, You don't want too many things. They become a burden. In fact, we shouldn't have too many things in this life. Good food, clothes to wear, do good with all the rest. Minerva okay. believed in the pioneer ethic and practice of, and I'm sure you know what that is. It goes, use it up, wear it out, make do, or do without. In 1998, a major exercise a mission was presented at the Church Museum of History and Art. 
in 2001, an heirloom edition of the Book of Mormon was issued by the Deseret Book Company. They only printed a thousand copies at a hundred bucks a pop. They didn't know how well it would sell. As a matter of fact, only we heard about it three or four days after they went on sale, called immediately, and we told them that they were all gone. When we got on away with this, the Deseret Book Company ordered an additional 10,000 to be printed. And you can buy that. It's, it's a marvelous. It's illustrated by Minerva K. It is a beautiful book. My last interaction, interaction uh, occurred with Minerva in 1953. Uh, I was a freshman at BYU and had come home with my uh, close buddy, Sharon Dayton. Uh, his father was a bishop for 26 years in the Cold Field War. Uh, we had come home, I don't remember what for. While we were home, John calls. He was also home. He, John was a graduate student at uh, Brigham Young University at the time. And asks if he can ride back and he's not sure. So we go down again and Minerva follows us out to the car. And like I say, we were six foot, or five foot two. John is a big raw bone guy at six foot four. She pulls his head down his lip and kisses him goodbye. And I guess Sharon and I were standing here and I'm grinning her head smirks on her face. She whirls around and grabs me by the ears and pulls my head down her middle and kisses me soundly on the lips. And then it's Sharon's turn. Afterwards, she says, don't look so surprised, boys. I'm a mother in Israel. I can be just as much a mother to you as anybody. And then she said, be on your way and remember who you are. <laughs> we did, and we did. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 <laughs> Wonderful, perfect, perfect um, memories to share with us that are so personal. We appreciate that so much. We have refreshments, and we hope you'll all stay and enjoy them. Some apple crisp with uh, a la mode. So please um, join with us. Mary Louise will give us a blessing on the food and close our, our event. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather together tonight. What a blessing it is to hear of Brother Curtis's memories and his testimony as he tells of this wonderful sister who has blessed the lives of so many. We're grateful for her example in sharing her talents and sharing her testimony and having such righteous priorities in her life where her family came first. We're grateful for each other as members of the church and, and members of the community and we pray that in every way we can we will also share our talents and testimonies and be a strength and a help to each other. We're so grateful for this <clears throat> lovely building in which we can meet and the refreshments that have been prepared and we pray that God would bless those who have prepared them for their goodness and generosity and pray that we'll derive some nutrition from them. We love thee, we thank you for all of our blessings, and we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.